one of the more confusing seasons throughout the course of the liturgical year has to be Easter. And so even though people might intuit that they're meant to kind of celebrate on some level, or they're celebrating, practically speaking, the fact that they don't have to fast anymore, right? So finally, I can eat chocolate, finally I can eat chips, that kind of thing. And even if people know that they're meant to kind of celebrate the resurrection, what is the popular conception of the resurrection? It's basically a big family gathering, you know, with the sweeping meadow, babbling brook, maybe a couple of angels playing harps in the background. So kind of boring and perhaps even kind of pathetic if you think about it. And so obviously it kind of begs the question, what exactly is the proper spirit that we're called to bring to the table when it comes to the Easter season? Well, for guidance, perhaps we might look at the scriptures and the liturgy in general. And so obviously preceding Easter Sunday is Palm Sunday, there's Holy Thursday, and most notably in a certain sense, Good Friday. And so in the context of Good Friday, what we find is in a certain sense the peak of human dysfunction. And so for example, we find betrayal and abandonment on the part of the disciples. We find wickedness at its peak when it comes to the scribes and the Pharisees. And on top of that, of course, we find the crucifixion of our Lord, the crucifixion and death of our Lord on the cross, where he takes upon himself the sins of the world. But then, of course, what happens? All of a sudden, the scene shifts, the page turns. And then we have all these amazing post-resurrection accounts where the resurrected Christ encounters various people in the context of the gospel in their brokenness and in their frailty. And so, for example, we have the really famous story of Mary Magdalene at the empty tomb, where her hope is suddenly restored. Women, why are you weeping? Whom are you searching for? We also have the story of St. Thomas, Doubting Thomas, this man who is led from a place of doubt to making the clearest articulation of Christ's divinity that we find in the entire gospel. My Lord and my God. And then, of course, we have St. Peter, who is very much reaffirmed in his original vocation to be the first pope. Hence that really famous line, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. In any case, in all these different stories, I want you to know it's a really distinct and recurring pattern. And so basically what we find, first of all, is that during the season of Lent, things are stirred up. And so past wounds are exposed, new frailties are brought to the surface, and all these different characters, again, people like Mary Magdalene, St. Thomas, and Peter himself, all these people have a greater awareness of their need for conversion and therefore their need for Christ. But of course, what you find in the case of all these different individuals is that their respective stories don't end there. But instead, they continue and are brought to a place of healing and redemption in the context of the Easter season. And on top of that, the fact that the Easter season is meant to last for 50 days, even longer than the 40 days of Lent, kind of tells us something about this whole process. And so what the Lord basically wants to give to us in the context of the Easter season, but also moving forward in the future, is not so much a quick fix. But instead, he wants to give us true healing, true restoration. And so finally, one day in the future, we are fully human and therefore fully alive. And so they also the point, the example that comes to mind is my internship year. And so that year when you're still in seminary, you're to be a priest, where you're placed in a parish to learn about parish life. And it just so happens that in the context of the rectory in this parish setting, my room was directly across from the pastor's room, and both our doors were open, right? So he could see me, I could see him pretty much all the time. And what happened, especially in the early going, was that he would come to me and say to me, Eric, you know, you seem bothered. We should talk. And in my mind, I was thinking, well, nothing's bothering me. And consciously, nothing was bothering me. In retrospect, because I was kind of burying things deep in my heart. But anyways, before the day was over, I would find myself in my pastor's room, sitting in a chair across from him, where again, he would ask the question, what's bothering you? And to be honest, in that moment, I kind of thought to myself often, well, I could think of one thing, but I don't want to tell you because it's kind of rude. But anyways, in, in those moments, he would continue to press until finally I would realize, well, gosh, I, I guess there is something that's kind of bothering me. And it's not just a little thing, it's actually kind of a huge thing. And before you know it, I'll be bawling my eyes out, talking about this particular wound in my heart, which I hadn't realized was there until we started talking. And whenever we had these conversations, they typically wouldn't end with a definitive reconciliation of all my you know, woundedness and brokenness, but instead they would end with a, a slight sliver of hope. And so oftentimes I would say to him some variation of like, look, I feel hopeful to take one more step in the future, one more step until basically tomorrow. And that's basically how we talked pretty much day after day, week after week throughout the course of that year. And I got to tell you, friends, that whole internship year and that recurring scenario of me kind of pouring my heart out in vulnerability and being received by my internship pastor really helped to kind of inform my whole approach to priestly ministry going forward in the future. Because the thing I want you to notice here is that the thing which ultimately changed my heart for the better wasn't so much a collection of wise and clever sayings, even though my pastor was wise and even though he was clever. What changed me was his willingness to journey with me in my brokenness, to give me this experience time and time again where I can feel weak and vulnerable before my friend and he does not reject me. 
And you see, in doing that, in staying in that space, and journeying with me through my weakness and through my brokenness over a long period of time, he effectively mediated to my soul the healing and redemptive love of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, on top of that, this whole experience, this whole process taught me that even though it's obviously really important to maintain this regular habit of prayer, hopefully that goes without saying, and to frequent the sacraments often, especially the Mass, especially the sacrament of confession, at the same time, you can't avoid the real work. The real work of basically facing yourself and all your vulnerabilities, insecurities, frailties, and sins. But again, never alone, but always with people, always with people, always in community, always with people who love you and whose love you actually trust. But you know, we can even take the thing one step further. And in fact, we actually should, because this is a really important part of the equation. No matter who we are, no matter how hard we try or how many gifts and talents we might have, eventually each one of us comes face to face with the reality of human limitation as a result of which we have to turn to the Lord to say to him, look, I've done all that I can. And so now yet again, I need to turn to you to be the savior of the world and indeed the savior of my own life. And so the example that comes to mind is a funeral that I did actually recently here at the parish. And so basically the person who died was a really dynamic person who was a really loving person as well. So he really loved people in general, but especially the poor and young people. And so everyone loved him and he loved them back. And what's interesting is that in terms of like the bio that was submitted in terms of giving me bullet points about the person who died, everyone contributed. So usually it's written by one person, but in this case, everyone kind of contributed. And the thing that was really interesting was that everyone kind of said similar things. And for me, one of the most memorable things that the people said about this person who had died was that he loved to joke, but he never did so at anyone's expense. And again, that was a consensus on the part of multiple people as opposed to simply a few. And to be honest, I think the reason why I found that particular point to be so compelling was because it spoke to this notion of integrity. Because if you read between the lines, you don't get the sense that this person had all sorts of really negative, sarcastic jokes that he was just dying to tell, but for the pursuit of virtue. Instead, he got the sense that he was being very simple, and he was simply speaking of the abundance of his heart. And what was his heart filled with? Not negativity or bitterness or meanness, but instead joy, kindness, and love. And so again, he always joked, but never at anyone's expense. In any case, the reason why I bring up this particular story is because when I was preparing a funeral and I was learning more about this wonderful person who had died, quite honestly, the question that came to mind was, how could God let a person like this die? Like, what's God's response to this? What's our response to this? The response should be and must be the resurrection as understood properly, not simply a family gathering full stop, but that moment when all things are made new, when every tear is wiped away and every desire of the human heart is brought to fruition. Okay, one final note, and I'll kind of end with this. And so basically, I was on YouTube the other day, and I happened to catch this really short video by Sister Miriam James Heidlin, where she was giving her closing remarks at the end of this Lenten mission she had given over the course of the 40 days of Lent. And so basically, what she said was this. As I was preparing for this mission or this retreat, I was picturing your faces. And so please know that, first of all, I was praying for you throughout the course of this preparation. And even though I know that most of us will never meet during this time we have here on Earth, I do hope to meet you on the other side of the veil, where hope, beauty, rest, goodness, and health, all these things flow for all eternity. That place that, in the words of C.S. Lewis, is like a book, where every chapter gets better, where all of us, without exception, will continue to grow, in all things hoped for, and all things imagined. I long for that day. I pray for that day. And I hope that one day in the future, I'll see you there. And may God bless you all.